um, titles reality pedagogy, hip hop ed, and STEM education. Um, my, my work falls under the umbrella of this construct that I call reality pedagogy. And reality pedagogy itself doesn't start on its own. So as I alluded to earlier, it, it's an amalgamation of different forms of thought, but m primarily it, it is the intersection of uh, culturally relevant pedagogy and critical pedagogy. That's how I envision it. I, I glean from critical pedagogues like Gloria Latson Billings that talk about the importance of focusing on the culture of youth in classrooms and utilizing that as the anchor from which you go into instruction and folks who say that you have to understand the culture of a population before you delve into it. Um, but I also draw from the work of like Joe Kinchelow and Shirley Steinberg in critical pedagogy that focuses on really encouraging youth and teachers to ask profound questions about the structures at play within their school. That the work, whether you're teaching English or social studies or science, like it, it doesn't stand alone if the work doesn't ask people or to give people the opportunity to use the information they glean from you to make some sense of their worlds. So my work is like right in the middle of there. I view all of my work as, as it's a work of intersections. It's a work of finding where things that are seemingly disparate come together and blossom into something else. And so reality pedagogy is just a blossoming of these two worlds. Um, but as we sort of take in and soak in and absorb the work of scholars before us, it's also important for us to critique. And critique, you know, nicely, but you know, there's something really hip hop is about that, right? One thing that's powerful about hip hop is nobody's at the top of the game for that long. If, if you sit at the top of the game, or if your work sits at the top of the game, at some point somebody's gonna come and you know, try to you know, strike at it a little bit. So my, my work, it interrogates hip hop, but it also comes with sort of this hip hop sensibility. Utilizing the sort of the, the ontology of the hip hop experience in how I, I attack or how I delve into academic work. So if anybody's rocking for a minute, I can play respect, I can sample it, but I'm also gonna be like, so by the way, you know, what's popping with this aspect of the work? Um, and, and so my, my critiques and soft critiques have always been that the work in critical uh, pedagogy and culturally relevant pedagogy has oftentimes been implanted upon populations rather than having the work sort of grow organically from the young people in classrooms. So even though culturally relevant pedagogy, for example, is a powerful framework that my work wouldn't exist without it, a lot of educators in classrooms have taken this idea of culturally relevant pedagogy and say, I'm going to learn about the culture in front of me, and then I'm going to enact pedagogy that will attack culture or will address culture. And, 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 and while that is powerful in many respects, it's also really problematic because it means then that there's no mechanism for understanding the culture of the population. Right, my, my, my critique, I start every talk by saying, it can't be culturally relevant if it's based on the educator's perception or the researcher's perception of what the culture is. So that's like a major inherent flaw in, in, in that approach, or at least as it's been played out. Maybe not in the, in the theorizing of the approach of how it plays out. So folks are like, you know, hip hop pedagogy, I want to be culturally relevant, let me listen to you know, the top 40, or let me listen to a certain music, or let me hang out in the hood for a minute. And then because of that experience, they feel like they have some inroads into the culture. Then they enact a pedagogy that's inherently flawed because it's a superficial rendering of the culture. Right? So reality pedagogy is saying, all right, fine. Let's start with saying it's reality pedagogy. Because when we say that, and Anna Arendt talks about that in sort of standpoint theory, by saying it's reality pedagogy, we have to acknowledge that no one has any deep insight into somebody else's reality. Right? So you come in from a position where you are saying, I am flawed as researcher, I am flawed as pedagogue, and the other person who I want to study with or study for is the expert. And if that's the case, then I have to try to have that person share the realities of the experiences with me. And what's beautiful about that is it allows us to not paint urban youth of color who are immersed in hip hop with this sort of block, right? Now you're saying, well, if you're from Chicago and you're from New York, your hip hop experience varies. In fact, if you're from New York and you're from Brooklyn and you're from the Bronx, your realities vary. And so now it, it forces the educator to say, how can I create a mechanism for engaging in conversations with young people about their experiences in and with hip hop? So that's what reality pedagogy sort of brings forth. And I'm going to delve deeply into like the nuances of reality pedagogy, like the, the tools through which we can get this information. But you guys rock with me so far, right? Mm -hmm. So and, and so like under this umbrella of reality pedagogy is what guides the whole work and the experience. Um, I'm going to talk about two different projects that I'm working on. So the, the first project that was just two years old as of like last week is on um, Hip Hop Ed. So Hip Hop Ed is the hashtag Hip Hop Ed on Twitter. And it, it, I started it with a young man, Brandon Frame, in, in Connecticut, and then we actually sort of grew out of that and formed a larger research group, TDJ6899, shout out to you, homie, Emil Cook, shout out to you. Um, so these folks, Emil, I mean, Brandon and I were having a conversation about hip hop, and we used hip hop ed as the sort of hashtag, 
And then it grew into all these folks saying, hey, this is an interesting conversation. And then it evolved into us having this meeting every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you're not on Hip Hop Ed, like, you're just not really about that life. Like, you're just not really doing it. But um, every Tuesday night at 9 p.m., we all converge on Hip Hop Ed, and we have conversations about the nature of hip hop. And what's powerful about Hip Hop Ed, in my opinion, is it is, it is a, a tool through which we start bridging the divides that have begun to exist within the world of hip hop education and hip hop studies. And folks are not talking about it, but the reality is that we're all so happy to be studying hip hop in like universities like UW Madison and Columbia that we don't realize that we have started creating a gulf within each other in the nature of our work. So there are folks who are now hip hop pedagogues and hip hop educators, and then there are folks who are in hip hop studies. And the hip hop studies folks are usually housed in African American studies departments or sort of cultural studies departments, and the hip hop educators are in ed schools. And the nature of the work that we produce, it's starting to align with paradigms within each of those domains. And it's not yet been a huge enough gulf, but it's almost like being able to see the inception of Pangea, right? Like you just see it folding, you're like, damn, son, I hope we don't do this. And so what Hip Hop Ed does is purposefully engage in conversations that every week either delves deeply into hip hop education and hip hop pedagogy or and hip hop studies. So we'd have a critique of Kendrick Lamar's album and its impact on education, and then next week we're like, well, how do you teach fourth graders using Jay-Z lyrics? And so we, it's, a, it's a really conscious decision to ensure that we work to pull the chains that may possibly divide hip hop studies and hip hop education together. And on um, Hip Hop Ed, um, it, it's a range of topics. We showcase the work of other hip hop educators, which is what I love about this thing. I mean, one week it might be about my work, and another week is about some cat who we discovered somewhere in like Utah doing some work with hip hop and education, and they have an opportunity to sort of take the helm of the conversation as well. And the idea is to create some unity within the field of hip hop education and hip hop studies. Or oh, why name it any of that? And so we just name it Hip Hop Ed. And that's our logo. And um, at the end of today, I'm going to give out these, um, this, this is our new promo mechanism. It's, it's just so hip hop. I'm going to give out these white pieces of paper with our, with our logo. And so if you tweet with the hashtag Hip Hop Ed with the logo, you may possibly receive a Hip Hop Ed t-shirt. Right? <laughs> so, same. We have a graphics the promo, right? So, so that's Hip Hop Ed. And then the other, uh, the other avenue of my work, or the other realm of my work, is this work in, in STEM education, more specifically science education. And so a lot of folks do a lot of work in hip hop and education, and it, it aligns so nicely with poetry. It aligns so nicely with debate. It aligns so nicely with literature. And, and in fact, let me take that back. It is forced to align so nicely with debate. It's forced to align nicely with literature. But in the but reality is, if, if we all understand that hip hop is a cultural understanding and it's a way of knowing and being, then it shouldn't focus only on literacy and only focus on poetry. It should focus on any field of study. And then there should be experts within any specific academic domain that utilizes a hip hop based theoretical framework to explore their research. And so my decision to go into STEM is actually a political act. It's a political decision to ensure that we focus on disciplines that folks who are immersed in hip hop are positioned outside of, right? Hip science is, is perceived as a discipline for the best and the brightest, right? And folks who are immersed in hip hop are perceived as being anti-intellectual. So the gulf between the best and the brightest and the anti-intellectual are so large, again, here I am with my intersection work, the, the work is to create a space where we reframe that, we reprogram that idea. And so we're, we're, we're purposefully ensuring that the work in and of hip hop is brought into science education that you're not really the best and the brightest. And if you are the best and the brightest, the best and the brightest exists within hip hop as well. With STEM, I use science as a main tool, technology as an artifact that drives the tool, engineering as sort of an engineering mindset, and mathematics because everything is mathematics. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the five percenters in science and mathematics in that realm. I'll touch upon that a little bit because science and mathematics are inherently in hip hop. In fact, without this notion of the, what people term as colloquial science and mathematics in hip hop, there would be no contemporary hip hop. Hip hop was partly birthed out of the work of Plan 13X, who articulated a science and math of hip hop. That was a direct response to, in my opinion, the science and mathematics in schools, because science and math is so westernized and, 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 so, and so stoic and so, and so structured and still positioned as the best and the brightest. So we're going to engage in this process. We have our own science and mathematics that rivals or even surpasses school science and mathematics. And so hip hop is actually, at its core, it's more science and mathematics than anything else. In reality, I mean, that really messes people's heads up. But, but, but it, it's, it's more that than anything else. So now, like, how do I get into this? 
I get into this, and I, I sort of alluded to, to it a little bit earlier about uh, this focus on this idea of the, of the politics of, of exclusion. That the reason why we don't have, I'm um, sliding, my fault. The reason that we don't, why we don't have um, scientists and mathematicians who are from or, or, or birthed from the culture of hip hop is because of this politics of exclusion that exists. Um, I, and I have that, that Sputnik picture there on the side because the biggest shift in science education in the United States happened in the 1950s. I've lost over this. It's kind of boring. Um, happened in the 1950s, and in the 1950s was when they had the most concerted effort to focus on science, science education in this country. And at the same time, let's think about the environment of the 1950s in the United States. It was, it was, a, it was a very sort of racially tenuous and, and, and tension time. And so the first time that we started making decisions about the best and brightest within science was the same time nationally that we were making the decisions about the best and brightest not being people of color. And so the roots of how we look at youth in classrooms and the youth of science education start with this big divide, right? And so I, I argue that the politics of exclusion is what leads to the fact that actually not even just youth of color immersed in hip hop life, a, a large amount of the population doesn't do well in science and mathematics. This phrase, I'm not good in math, I'm not good in science, it's, it's become sort of ingrained into the national, con national consciousness. I mean, you, you can ask anyone, you know, what subject you're into? And it's like, math? Oh, man, I can't do that. Science? Nah, son. It's, it's, it's just a general perception of anyone who's not part of the discipline that was initially conceived or, uh, as, or perceived as, rather, the best and the brightest. All right? You still rocking with me? Yes. All right? So, so now, why, why science? This is, I did this like a few minutes ago. I'm like, I just Googled uh, scientists. Google image of scientists. And these are all the images that came up. Um, and so that's, that's part of why science. Oh, sorry. You gotta have to remind me. Somebody's trying to do this for me. Do you mind? I got you. This just stops my flow, man. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yep. So, so why science? So these are images of scientists. And if you look at those images of scientists, I, I mean, I'm not gonna spell it out, just, just look at them, right? <laughs> one, they're, they're, they're mostly caricatures when you think of scientists. Um, one, they're mostly white. One, they're mostly old. Some have crazy hair. It's, it's just a, a general perception of what science is, what science should be. And I argue that that's part of the policies of exclusion. The politics of exclusion is not an overt act. It's a subtle act, right? It's, it's, it's when you turn on a cartoon. What's the name of that dude in the cartoon? Um, Dexter. Dexter's Laboratory, right? Dexter, <laughs> Dexter's, Dexter's a real cool dude. Like, I rock with Dexter. But De the imagery of what Dexter is and what he represents, the, the white lab coat, the, it reaffirms existing perceptions about what is science and what, it is, what, what science is and what it isn't, right? And so that's part of the reason why we engage in this process. And then, lastly, because I, I want to sort of delve into the theory piece, because, you know, this is a whole, you know, another sidebar. We oftentimes, as academics, either perceived as theorists or practitioners or philosophers, right? And I think that neither can be divorced from the other. So I'm going to get into the practical, like, what are we doing stuff, but you got you know, I'm, you're going to get that work first, so you got to get the, um, the theory first, all right? Um, by the way, anybody know where you're going to get that work comes from? Lo Lux. Lux. Google that battle. Lo Lux versus... Um, Calico. Calico. I almost forgot dude's name. I actually remembered him a long time ago. It was a total annihilation. Anyway, so um, the work is this framework. And this framework that, 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 I, that I sort of put together is this notion of neo-indigenous cosmopolitanism. It's a mouthful, a lot of syllables, but for a reason. It's not just because. Um, I use the term neo-indigenous because I, I argue that the populations that have been most oppressed in our global history are the indigenous populations whether we are talking about the Aboriginal in Australia, where we're talking about the Maori in New Zealand, where we're talking about the Native American in the United States. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain, like we know what we did was screwed up, but we are like, at least we acknowledge that we've done something bad. Like Australia's like, we gave a formal apology, we're great, right? So there's this, there's, this, there's this global acceptance of the fact that these populations are marginalized, and I argue that when it comes to urban youth of color, particularly those immersed in hip hop, there isn't a national consciousness that understands that we have marginalized and oppressed those populations in schooling. Like there's not an understanding that hip hop was actually created as a response to poor schooling. That they were in that high school, in the Bronx, and it was boring as hell, and people were trying to get school clothes money, and that's where hip hop was birthed from. So hip hop is actually a response to schools, right? And so schools, that means that schools has this history of oppressing. And I argue that that oppression that occurs through the process of schooling is analogous to the processes of oppression that have occurred with indigenous populations. And I do sort of pay homage to indigenous populations because we acknowledge the fact that they've been oppressed, but we acknowledge and then sweep under the rug. And so by bringing forth a theoretical framework that acknowledges the indigenous and pulls the experiences of the, ne of the indigenous with who I term the neo-indigenous, then we pay homage to them and respect them and we understand that we've oppressed large amounts of people. 
And I argue that urban youth of color are the neo-indigenous. Why? Because they share, the, they share the same characteristics. Particularly young people who are immersed in hip hop, they share the same characteristics as the indigenous. Distinct linguistic practices. Yo, what up, son? Emerges from, hey, how you doing? Right? That, that's a distinct linguistic practice that is analogous to the linguistic practices of indigenous populations. The close ties to places of origin. The indigenous have a spiritual connection to the land. Urban youth have a, a spiritual connection to their block and their hood, right? Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then this oppression at the hands of a larger other, whether it be the criminal justice system or it be the colonizers, the same experience. So with this idea of neo-indigenousness, we are saying that oppression is oppression, marginalization is marginalization, and it must be acknowledged, and we can acknowledge how it's occurring with young people of color today by looking at the connections to the oppression that's existed before us. Then I bring forth this idea of cosmopolitanism. And cosmopolitanism is a philosophical tenet that talks about the fact that you know, all human beings are connected to each other. Everyone should have connections to each other. I draw strongly from the work of Kwame Appiah and some sort of, sort of large historical sort of Greek work talking about cosmopolitan relationships to each other. And I argue that we cannot be accepting of the indigenous if we don't understand that what's necessary is an indigenous or neo-indigenous cosmopolitanism. The act of cosmopolitanism and feeling responsible for each other is the work of the educator. Because then you have to realize that the educator's role is not necessarily to teach. It is to enact a role where you are acknowledging, absorbing, feeling, experiencing the indigenous experience. That you're always searching for an understanding of their reality. And you're always an outsider. The researchers talk all the time about this edict emic perspective. Like, I could be from an outside background, but if I spend a long enough time in there, I get it. And I disagree with that fact, that notion. I, I say that once you get into a space, you develop your own understanding of the experience, but never the true experience of the other person, right? And so I, I argue that an edict, a, a, a sort of emic, a emic experience in, a research, in research never truly comes. It's like what I say about hip hop. You know, no one's an expert on hip hop. Everybody's an expert on their relationship with hip hop, but no one is a true, ex a, a, a true expert on hip hop. Which means that somebody who started listening to hip hop two years ago is a full expert in his iteration of what hip hop is, how it's defined his life from two years. Just like an OG who was like in the spray paint and understands the work in a more nuanced way from a superficial viewing in has a very different experience. The expertise varies. And once we respect each other's expertise, then we can, we can come on this idea of neo-indigenous neo cosmopolitanism. And so that diagram you see there is looking at the nested social fields drawn from the work of Bourdieu, saying that fields have porous boundaries. And so, that, so if fields have porous boundaries, like what happens outside this room has an effect what happens in this room, what happens globally, historically, colonization has an effect on what goes on in the urban classroom today. Right? And that framework helps me to make sense of so many things. It helps me to make sense of how kids, make, how kids do well in classrooms, but it also helps me to make sense of the, the, the collateral damage the collateral psychic damage on the consciousness of educators. Um, this is particularly the case when I, when I deal with Caribbean teachers. So most teachers who are African American in urban settings have Caribbean backgrounds. Did you guys know that? Like, so people usually say, you know, let's focus on having more black teachers, which is great. And then, but usually those who become black teachers are black teachers who have Caribbean roots. It's fascinating. And if those teachers have Caribbean roots and are from Jamaica, or they're from Trinidad, or they're from any of these other places, their experiences, their, their versions, their iterations of the black hip hop experience is, is varied, right? So that's why you would have a teacher who's from Jamaica who goes into a school to teach youth who are immersed in hip hop and is insistent on the fact that the kids, you know, shut the heck up and sit down because she has inherited this colonization experience. She's experienced schooling in Jamaica that is sort of so influenced by colonization that when she comes into the classroom in the United States, she gives a form of that on young people. And so the, the idea here is not even about color, it's about experience. It's about relationships with the culture and views and perceptions of the culture. All right, you still rocking with me? Yeah. All right. So, so I then start pushing for, uh, towards a hip hop based theoretical framework. And what that is, is a, it's a, I, I'm surprised that we haven't done it yet. So we're at a point here in the world of hip-hop education and hip-hop studies, whatever, where we're, we use other theoretical frameworks to explain what happens pedagogically in classrooms. And you know, the, the, the frameworks are endless. And I argue that hip-hop has given us a straight up, right there theoretical framework. The pillars of, of hip-hop, the elements of hip-hop, like that's a framework. 
it's nuanced and it gives, it gives information about what every ideal teaching and learning scenario should be. So I argue that a, a, a hip-hop based theoretical framework has four, five major tenets, but four actual tenets, one philosophical tenet, one of emceeing, one of graffiti, one of DJing, and one of breakdancing. Um, oh, your slide has that, and mine is actually just doing that because we're going for PDF. Right, so from emceeing, we can, from these four elements, we can look at what should happen in every classroom. So every classroom should have an element of performance, where students get up to the front of the classroom and pay, perform a teaching act, where there, every classroom has to have movement. Every classroom experience, every teaching experience has to be able to use analogy. Every hip-hop experience should be able to use story. This is not stuff I'm pulling from thin air. This is what the, the, the art of emceeing tells me should happen in every teaching and learning space. So that if you're teaching a youth, uh, youth who are immersed in the hip-hop, hip, from the hip-hop generation, then you have to look at emceeing, look at the striations of emceeing, and make sure that every teaching experience covers all those elements. So that's a framework through which you can lay upon teaching and to get what we want out of it. From graffiti, you have to have the, uh, the uh, visibility. Students' work has to be present, not in the way you just plaster it, but it's present and it's their creation, and it is art, there's art. From DJing, we have to use technology and manipulate technology, not to have kids have technology to, to just type but manipulate the technology, break it down, recreate it, just like, uh, you know, just like DJs do tech takers, right? It's, it, and from um, breakdancing, you have to have movement and verb in the classroom. And then lastly, you have to have this knowledge itself. So I think that these, the emceeing, graffiti, DJing, and breakdancing give you these four sort of actual things that you want to use in the classroom to engage young people. And then this fifth element of knowledge itself gives us an opportunity to sort of delve to the philosophical components of a hip-hop theoretical framework. And that philosophical component can vary based on your area of expertise, in my opinion. My area of expertise happens to be science. Any scientists in the building? One and a half. All right, it's fine. Wisconsin, any scientists in the building? You! All right. Just me and you, kid. Just me and you. All right, so, so I talked about this uh, knowledge of self, and I think knowledge of self could be then in, in, the, in the pedagogical act can be, can be used as a knowledge of self in the teaching and learning process. So a knowledge of what it is I want to know, a knowledge of what it is I know already, a knowledge of the subject area, a knowledge of how the information in the subject area can impact what happens in my real life. So if I'm teaching a math class, there's a mathematical knowledge of self that must exist. If I'm teaching a science class, there's a scientific knowledge of self that must exist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've done the work in science. If you want to do the work in another domain, it's, it's all you, just cite me. Um, so, so in science, we, what I've done is I've identified you know, uh, the, the most brilliant, the most prolific scientists of our time, and then identified what skills, dispositions, tenets they, they possess. So, and I've termed these things science-mindedness. And I've, I've gotten this work from, you see the citations at the bottom, a bunch of science educators that look at, it, at the spirit of science. They're not worth uh, citing all the time. But, but, but what I've gleaned from that research on what makes science a scientist is, that they have certain characteristics, like they make keen observation, their, their words are evidence-based, they're skeptics, they use analogy, they express creativity, they use uh, analytical reasoning, reasoning, they have a lot of curiosity, they're anti-authoritarian. And this is what you can, you, you can name the scientists that are iconic and see how they fit into these characteristics. Einstein possessed all these characteristics. Kakuli possessed all these uh, characteristics. Bohr and creation of an atomic model possess all these, all these same characteristics. Einstein imagined himself riding a light beam out of space, damn it. Like, you know, so, you know, so that, that's completely sort of anti-authoritarian. It's making these analogies between reference points. It's, it's keen observation. The, so these scientists possess these skills. So then I say, where do we see human beings who possess these same skills? Let's identify groups of people who, who address these same skills. And these same skills are possessed by rappers, MCs, b-boys, right? And so if the alignment occurs in the skills of what it takes to be scientific, then we have to find a way through which we use the structure of school science to awaken that science-mindedness in a way that helps them make sense of content, right? I can stop at the point where I say, look, rappers have scientific skills. So they're smart. Case closed, slam the laptop, and I'm out the building, right? And that's fine. But we have to also say, because they possess these skills, we can create scenarios where these skills can be exhibited within science classrooms. And we, we can also help them to appropriate the discourse of power. And this is where we always stop short. Like us, when I say us, I'm talking about you and me too, I've done it too where we get to the point where we're like, okay, young people are engaging, we, we see all these markers of, of, of success, they're, they're wonderful, but 
but we are doing them a disservice if we don't create the opportunities for them to utilize these skills to be able to be successful in conventional markets and methods of assessment. Now, I'm not protest at all, but I want my kids to be able to be like, yo, I'm, I'm hood, I'm gangster, and I passed that test. And so the next step then is to apply the science mindedness. So in the, in the work of the application of science mindedness, my work then is to find out what structures within schools, and I, have, I believe in this dialectical relationship between structure and agency, what structures within schools limit the opportunities for kids to exhibit these science mindedness? It's a completely different view from how come these kids are failing, right? Now we're saying, well, we know they have these skills, so what is going on in the school that's inhibiting this from happening? And once we sort of identify those things, oh, this, you're not ready for that yet. Yeah. Um, once we're able to identify those things and we can find out what, what, what inhibits that, what we found is that what the big thing that inhibits that is, is not the students, and sometimes it's not the teacher, it's through the teacher, but it's the structure of schooling. Right? It's the structure of schooling. There are educators who believe in progressive approaches to instruction that are working to do this in their classrooms, but the infrastructure within the schools disallows progressive practice. And if the infrastructure cannot support the practice, then you know, you're, you're beating your head against the wall. So what we're doing now is working through hip hop to challenge the infrastructure. Challenge what Habermas calls the pedagogy of poverty that exists within schools. Because the pedagogy of poverty is the inhibitor to true science. Because let me, let me lay this back out for you. So science in itself is inquisitive. It's, it's metaphor, it's analogy, it's story. Hip hop is these exact same things. The structures of schools, the structure of school science does not support actual science. Particularly with youth who are immersed in hip hop in urban settings. Why? Because all the characteristics of science if expressed in schools, it's scary as fuck. Excuse me, I know this is recorded, it's recorded, but you know what I mean? Like, it's scary, right? If you, if you want to support a scientist, and you're saying, I want you to be anti-authoritarian, and I want you to be a skeptic, that means that you're creating a scenario where kids have to ask you why. They have to say, I don't believe that. I want to see an actual example. How does that apply to my life? And that's inherently scientific. So because of that, we can get into the science of and in and with hip hop, and, and then sort of paths towards solutions. Um, and so really quickly, does anybody, can anybody identify what any of those pictures means or represents? Anyone? Okay, so the first one is the five percenters, right? The second is just a mixtape that's a drop in science, but it was dope, so slowly. <laughs> and, and the third um, is a diagram that describes the characteristics of indigenous science. So now I'm bringing it back to science. We talk about the indigenous thing, we talk about indigenous science. Now, indigenous science, it's almost oxymoronic if you ask some scientists. What do you mean indigenous science? To be indigenous and to be scientific is like what? But there's a lot, there's a lot of work within science education that's focusing on this idea of traditional ecological knowledge. And taking traditional ecological knowledge and viewing that as scientific, what is that? People's knowledge is about their immediate surroundings. Utilizing science finding skills to make sense of their environment. And if you look at traditional eco ecological knowledge and its characteristics, one, a focus on culture and identity, a focus on management of systems within the community, uh, looking at factual observations, using at past the current uses of phenomena, use, looking at ethics and values, this notion of science within traditional ecological knowledge is actually very aligned to the science of the five percenters. That talks about knowledge, wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, equality, food, clothing, shelter, love, peace, happiness, and understanding of the immediate environment. And so what we, what we find now is that the, the alignment between the indigenous and the neo-indigenous comes full circle once more. And if it comes full circle once more, this is the kind of stuff that we're doing to sort of try to change the game, right? We have to challenge the infrastructure. And so, by the way, I, you know, shameless plug, but it's all good. <laughs> On December 12, 2012, you guys all have to be there because in the Common Center at 6 p.m., we're launching this project called the Science Genius Battles. And the science genius battles is the outgrowth of all this research. The research has to have a practical component. And the science genius battles is sponsored by the iconic Jizza from the Wu-Tang Clan, who is the most humble and intelligent person I've, I've, I've literally ever met. Um, and the idea is to give youth rap instrumentals, is to give youth science content topics, and then allow them to express their science mindedness by making them create raps based on the content. 
y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Now, that has a level of engagement in hip hop, but if you're gonna be really hip hop, then we have to take it up to another level. Hip hop is focused on the art of the cypher and the art of the battle. So therefore, within those classrooms, young people who are creating these raps will be engaged in ciphers within their classrooms, surrounding the science topics. And the ciphers are situations where you have young people gathered together in a circle, exchanging ideas and rapping. So they're gonna have ciphers in their classrooms, but then we have to take it up to another level because we're, it's drawing from hip hop. We can't be superficial here. So hip hop also focuses on the art of the battle. So because of the art of the battle, we're gonna have those young people in those ciphers engage in competitions and preliminary battles with each other based on these science raps. They're gonna be assessed on their ability to spit, because you've gotta be able to rap, right? But also on the extent to which you pull in the science content. But beyond that, the extent to which you use your science-mindedness. So a kid who comes in here and says, yeah, 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 it's DNA, and y'all know we're not here to play, would not pass mustard in the school cipher or battle. Because if you're gonna use your science-mindedness, you have to use analogy and metaphor and weave it in a more profound manner. And this, again, is also a, a political movement against what's happening with commercial hip hop, where a multi-platinum selling artist can use nursery school rhymes and that be valued as hip hop. And so part of the decision also is let's have some 14, 15, 16 year olds really spit as a battle against commercialized watered down hip hop as well. And so we're gonna launch this project. The winner of the battles actually get to record their track possibly with, with, with or with Jizza around, because you know, his 16s cost money. And, 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 and at the end of it all, have their work posted on rapgenius.com, so it's also out there for the world to see, so the world can sort of annotate their lyrics and make some sense of the science. So the idea here is to take science out of the, the way it's been positioned and played out in school science and allow it to call forth these larger traditions. That's theoretically rich and it's authentic, right? Because the one thing you also want to do is make sure it's authentic. If you just tell kids, write science raps, that's whack, that's corny, right? And so you, you have to be able to be nuanced about your understanding of hip hop culture, at least your appreciation of it. In this process, we also, we also go into a process where we teach the educators to, you know, it's like those memes, like calm down and watch the students. Like, so they have, they have to sort of take a back seat to allowing the students to engage in the processes, right? And they might share their science expertise, but the kids share their hip hop expertise. So there's a sort of, there's a mutualism going on here. And then finally, because I want to make some time for questions, I read the study the other day about uh, the, the, the brains of freestyle rappers. And to me, it was just a, it was a, a, a neuroscientific affirmation of the sociological um, understandings that I've put into play. And by putting these two things together, we create a more strong justification for why this sort of hip hop based, rap based um, pedagogy is necessary. And what they did here was they, they, um, they looked at rappers who were freestyling versus rappers who had memorized rhymes. So they gave them the rhymes to memorize. And they put them in an fMRI, and they realized that the, the dorsolateral region of the rappers was diminished when they were doing memorized rhymes. Meaning that when I'm soaking in information passively, I lose certain skills. And what do you lose in a dorsolateral region is you lose self-control, self-monitoring, and self-censoring. Which is a direct response, in my opinion, to the pedagogy of poverty. Because if the pedagogy of poverty means sit down, be quiet, and soak in the science information, and the kids do not respond to that pedagogical practice, it's because it's forcing them to put down a part of their brain that, that is directly responsible for their self-control and impulse. So when a kid in the classroom tells you to shut the fuck up, they're saying that in response to the nature of the pedagogy that's completely distorting that part of their dorsolateral region because of the hyper-rigidity of the classroom experience. And at the same time, if you engage these kids in hip-hop that they are creating, and the creation of artifacts, are the parts of their brain get activated. So the medial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex get activated, and that invokes creativity, that invokes imagination, and creativity and imagination are what? Part of the skills of science-mindedness. So a hip-hop-based pedagogy that welcomes rap, hip hop, and the art of freestyle is not only best practice as far as what we think about sociologically, but now we have neuroscientific research to affirm that position. And then finally, cop my book. I'll ask any, I'll, I'll not answer any questions. I think most of this work, like the beauty of it comes from the questions there. I, I wanted to get into the nuances of reality pedagogy and, and some of the other projects we're working on, but I, I wanna just, like, let's just build and talk. Um, so I'll, I'll answer whatever questions anyone has.
Getting Real series is a collaboration between the University of Wisconsin, Teachers College, and NYU. This is a groundbreaking series where we're really just trying to see if we can uh, connect students from different campuses so that you can have access to amazing scholars like Dr. Emden and other practitioners in the field so that you can um, ask questions and build the community. Um, so what usually happens now is we go into Q&A. Um, like the teaching perspective as far as like assessment is concerned in the classroom with like cultivating their realities mm -hmm. um, and not putting your perception of their reality onto them through the assessment of their work in the classroom. I'm wondering how effective assessment of that would look to cultivate their realities and not really hinder them as you were just talking about. That's a brilliant question. So um, I, I talked today about philosophical work of reality pedagogy, but the more tangible practical work involves this process of the five C's. Lauren has heard ad nauseum about the five C's. And so the five C's are, first of all, ciphers or cogenerative dialogues. Second is co-teaching. The third is cosmopolitanism. The fourth is context focus, and the fifth is content focus. For the assessment, or the sort of um, the tool through which you sort of harness uh, true understanding of their realities, the cipher looks like the hip hop cipher. Um, and I, in edu speak, I call it the cogenerative dialogue, you know, because professors like words in multiple syllables. But essentially, you invite <laughs> students from the classroom to engage in a dialogue with the teacher about the structures of the classroom. It's simply that it's that simple. And what the teacher does is they engage students who represent different demographics in the classroom. So for example, you're getting 100 on every test, so I'm, I'm calling on you. You're getting a 20 on every test, so I'm identifying you. You're hyper-engaged, so I'm identifying you. You're not engaged at all, so I'm identifying you. Then they, we engage in a conversation outside of the classroom space about your experiences in the classroom. And the goal is to co-generate a plan of action for improving the next class. And so with that type of structure, you. By picking kids who represent different demographics, you're getting different types of insight. By forcing them to co-generate a single plan of action, you're forcing them to sort of develop this cosmopolitan ideal. And by structuring it like the hip hop cipher, you're calling forth what I call a sort of a hip hop cognitive anchor. So if I call it a cipher, it's not like, hey guys, let's chat about the class. Like it's a cipher. So they all know instinctively. We all stand up, we stand in a circle, we equal distance from each other, which is, which is like global rule one for the hip hop cipher. You can go anywhere across the globe. I've seen it in. Johannesburg, and I've seen it in Utah, where you're like, cypher, and MCs organically know what to do. And so when you name it a cypher, you sort of call forth something that's in their culture already, so the, the, the structure of the conversation already exists, and then you use that tool to be able to cultivate understandings of their realities. And then you implement that in the classroom. And it's, it's, it's more nuanced, you do it three times, and blah, 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 and we could talk if you, if you want to know about the details. My name is Angela Byers Winston, and I am passionate about broadening participation for underrepresented groups in STEM. And I was reading your article last week with Okan Lee, yeah. and uh, the one you published this year, a Teachers College Record in 2012, and you were looking at the Obama effect yeah. in terms of having students see themselves as connected to the evidence-based policy approach that President Obama has taken in his swag yeah. and feel like they can relate to STEM. And my particular passion is really about helping to understand how people's self-referent beliefs change when they feel related to the content that they're learning. And so I was interested specifically in any kinds of assessments in terms of measures you're using to look at changes in self-efficacy beliefs in particular re related to um, STEM-related academic self-efficacy. Brilliant question. Um, so th that the piece that she's talking about it came out of TCR and it's called Hip Hop, the Obama, the Obama Effect in Urban Science Education. Um, I'll start with the last part and then sort of come back. So the, the chief assessment tool I've been using right now are classroom learning environment surveys. They were developed by Barry Fraser. And what they do is they, they do a good measure of how students see their role in the classroom over time, their experiences with the content over time, and their perceptions about the structure of the classroom. And that gives us insight into their structures of themselves. So in the case of the Obama Effect study, what, what we literally did was we, um, we, we got a bunch of video clips of President Obama talking about science and science work and a selection of science advisors and played them for young people. We actually played it in the auditorium on a grand scale. And then we started tracking their, their view of self. So in, in essence, we wanted to steal that potential that he had and to cultivate that and steer it towards science. And it worked tremendously. So for the classroom learning environment surveys, kids saw themselves more scientists, saw themselves as being able to do science, saw themselves as being able to have science jobs in the future. So we use sort of conventional pre-post-test measures of their success in the discipline, 
and the CLES surveys to measure the larger environment and self uh, work. And, and um, though they seem to be really pretty accurate measures so far. We're actually in phase two of that now since he's um, he, he won another, um, another election. So we're like, all right, let's just keep going. So we, you know, keep, keep, no one doesn't work anymore. I, like, I hate to, I shudder to think of what uh, a Rami effect paper would have looked like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, I found your, your characterization of um, hip hop education and hip hop studies to be fascinating in this intersection uh, between culturally relevant pedagogy and critical pedagogy. Um, so the, I guess the first part of the question is, to what extent do you feel like that has been sort of located in hip-hop scholarship? Mm -hmm. What does that look now as opposed to what it looked like circa 1995 mm -hmm. since you had the drop in science? Mm -hmm. And I'm reading a thought of William Perkins. Of course. And mm -hmm. anthology. And my second question to you is, do you think that because hip-hop studies and, and hip-hop uh, education are housed in the spaces that it's in, that there's an inherent politics of respectability that reaffirms and reinscribes this discourse of a politics of exclusion that does one of two things. Either A, you know, it, we sort of want to uphold figures like Lupe Fiasco and Kendrick Lamar and sort of dismiss people like Joe Budden, and B, and I've heard various hip hop scholars say this, right? That I know this hip hop shit and so nobody can't fuck with me on this. Right. Right? So what are your thoughts on this? I think you answered the question. So like <laughs> I, like the latter the latter response answered the initial question, I think. And this has always been my take. I think the nature of academia forces us to, to it, it forces silos, and it creates hierarchies. And you know, the, academia also is it, academia to me is the seedbed of the replication of oppression, particularly for scholars of color. I'll elaborate. So let's say you have a you have a a person who has gone through processes of schooling, this grueling process of, of getting a PhD. What happens to that scholar oftentimes is that the, the, the blood, sweat, and tears of the experience allows them to position themselves as, as hyper-intellectual. And, and, and whatever oppression they, they received in the process towards attaining the degree is almost like this power that's held. And the first thing anybody wants to do when they have power for the first time in their lives is what? Find somebody else who, to, 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 to feel the brunt of their thing. I mean, this is, uh, Fanon talks about this brilliantly. This, is, this notion of replication of oppression. In, in his iteration, he talks about uh, the, the colonized, and once the colonizer leaves the space, how the colonizer, the colonized who has power, inflicts these damages on other folks who are like them. And I think you, you, you can look at academia in many respects as uh, it's going to get me in trouble, boy. But uh, but I mean, but in many respects, you can look at academia as a, a, a certain space where um, the work of, of of the black intelligentsia, if you if you want to call them that or scholars of color, it's oftentimes colonized, right? It's oftentimes taken and recrafted and reshaped and made to fit within the forms of the institution. And so because of that, 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 that forces a bifurcation. It forces you want to be an expert within a distinct field. Despite the fact that other folks are out there doing work, the nature of the institution, the infrastructure, supports the creation of silos. And so that's the new crop of, of hip hop educators, and I hate to say new crop, old crop, but the, the more recent crop of hip hop educators, I, I would argue, are, are looking for an opportunity to say, listen, don't forget us. Like, I'm, like, I'm new in the game, completely. Like, I, I come in here just have, like, folks that I've talked to in the last year or so, I'm like, oh my gosh, I read your work, oh my gosh, your icon. Like, Bukari Kitsawana sent me a text message the other day, and I almost passed out. I was like, oh shit, like, I, I lost it. And so, and so, you know, because that kind of relationship exists, for us, it's attention. It's like, are, are they really, reaching out to us, and so right now, I think there's a crop of scholars that are like, we're here, we're doing this work, and we don't want to follow the form of academia. We know you had to. And we're saying, if you hold on to us, we can together reshape how this looks. And I think that's where we are now. We know that not every student likes hip hop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're doing this battle with GISA, mm -hmm. I'm a fan, but there's that student that is like feeling left out, that doesn't have the skills to battle, that doesn't want to battle, where, where do you, what do you do with those students? It's a brilliant question. So um, I wish you had the slides back up, but this is why I termed the work reality pedagogy. And I think now I have to talk about the practical component of reality pedagogy. So reality pedagogy is, so it's birthed from hip hop. It's created from hip hop. The inspiration for it is hip hop. It, I come to teaching with this hip hop self that I cannot remove from who I am. But it's a, it's a tool that's birthed from hip-hop that's applicable for schooling. It's just good teaching. 
So let's walk through reality pedagogy. Let's say you're not hip hop. Let's say none of you like hip hop, you think it's awful, and I'm your teacher and I want to teach you. I could say, okay, I'm going to utilize reality pedagogy. What are the tenets of reality pedagogy? First, the notion of the cipher. There's nothing more hip hop than the cipher. But the cipher essentially is bringing young people who are, who are in the classroom to sit in a space to give you their, their insight on the structures of the classroom so the teacher can develop tools to teach them better. It's birthed from hip hop, but you don't need hip hop to engage in the cipher or co-generative dialogue. The second C of co-teaching, how did I come up with co-teaching? By going to concerts and saying, yo, no rappers are on stage, dolo. Mm -hmm. Right? That there's something about, Jay-Z does not have to do click. You understand know what I'm saying? Like, but he needs a click, right? And so there's this notion in hip hop of the need for a crew and the different roles of folks within the crew. So co-teaching is a, like after watching rappers for a very long time, I'm like, yo, in classrooms, kids have to have this co-teaching component. So it's birthed from hip hop, but if you want to enact co-teaching, you don't gotta be hip hop. The, the beautiful thing of cosmopolitanism is the same. The beauty thing, the structure itself is just the teaching. The beauty of it is that we're finally at a point in the world of education where Dewey doesn't have to tell me, or Piaget doesn't have to instruct me about what the best practice is. That we have developed best practice for all people through something that was created from hip hop. And if you enact reality pedagogy with hip hop youth, hip hop teaching will come out. But if you enact reality pedagogy with youth from any other background, their culture will emerge. But it's always rooted in hip hop. My question regarding to something that you had said earlier about how hip hop stems from um, school because school is a form of oppression. Uh, my question is, do you think hip hop would uh, has to always coexist with oppression or will there be a day where hip hop will exist without oppression? Wow. Thanks. <laughs> so here's my take and, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to sound like a pessimist. Um, so I, I believe there's a point where oppression in the contemporary forms can almost like develop and grow into something that is felt differently by different people. But the nature of social life to me is that forms of oppression will always exist. And if forms of oppression always exist, there has to be things to allow, there has to be a structure that allow us to move from it. Um, I'll give you an example of, of, of me, right? Now, everybody who hears me talk knows like nuances of my life. You guys are gonna piece it all together. I'm like, I know, write a biography if you care. But anyway, I, I think about my life, right? I think about, um, I think about myself as a seventh grader in Brooklyn, New York, where like, the, um, the building was not supposed to be open, but it was open anyway, and my mom had to turn on the oven to heat up the, the, the apartment, which is like bad, like you would die. Um, so, and I think about that, and I'm, in that experience, there are outright iterations of oppression, not having money, not having heat, not having, not having all these things. Then I think about myself today, right? And I'm on the phone, and I'm, I'm calling my crib and talking to my little brother, and um, he's like, um, yo, um, I wanted to get some new sneakers, and you only gave me 150, right? And so I, and I, I'm, I'm like, what? Right? And, and so I, and he's probably the age that I was then. Now, for him, we take it from the out of the society, out of the, in, the, in the everyday. His experiences are no, are very different from mine, but he still is a little black kid who got picked up by cops for playing football with his friends, right? So I think the way oppression gets felt is different, but unfortunately, it's a, it's 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 a, <laughs> I, I, not, I get to sound like a like a vulgar Marxist, and people, you know, like it, it happens. But I, I think the nature of a capitalist society is it, the, the, the nature of the capitalist society is is that. One person has, one person has not. The forms of have and have not vary over time. And as long as that is the social structure that we ascribe to, then there's going to be a need for something to respond to that. And, and that's hip hop. Um, but there'll always be hip hop, because there, there's, there's always going to be some, somebody doing something when everybody cares about money. Let's see, how does that play into the fact that a majority of hip hop sales are from upper middle class white America? and Clearly, the oppression might not be there, but yet they might have the same love for hip hop due to the fact that it's still those foundations yeah. that they listen to. So, it's a fascinating, fascinating question. And I've mulled this over a million and one times. And um, the two things. So, I think 
again, it's, that's an affirmation of the fact that a person has many forms. There's nothing more, when you're a teenager, anywhere, you think everybody in the world is against you. And I think that anything that can, can provide you a voice, and that's what hip hop does, people grab onto it. I think the issue with sales of hip hop, though, is, is a lot, it's, it's so much more nuanced. I think, I think the reason why hip hop sales are so high within certain middle class, socioeconomically advantaged communities is less of a function of their love for hip hop, but more of a function of the need for hip hop to affirm certain fantasies about what blackness and urbanness is. So, because if you look at what sells, right? Like what's selling in those communities, people love the beats or whatever else, but they, they love, like, I, like I was watching a video the other day about this kid named um, Trinidad James. Anybody heard of Trinidad James? So, just Google it, just, just, just because, right? And I, he's an interesting cat, so I Googled him, and um, I, was, I was in Atlanta a year and a half ago, and my people were like, yo, this kid's about to blow. And I was like, you violent, no way. It, just everything about him, I was like, impossible. And then yesterday, I was in the, in, in, in the web, and I put on Hot 97, and the song plays, and I'm like, it's your dad friggin' James, right here. <laughs> so so let's, let me play out your dad James really quickly. And, and, and I actually watched his videos and listened to his interviews, and he's a pretty articulate person with a beautiful view of the world. But his video, Golden Mod, this, this gold video, right? So he, and it's selling like crazy, right? It's, it's a suburban hit, right? And in that video, like he's like shirtless, crooked tooth, gold grill, like, you know, it's just, it feeds a certain image of what urbanness is that is, it, that it, 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 it it, it makes certain populations gravitate towards it, either because, they exo because it's exotic, one is because it's exotic and I just want to be part of what's exotic, or, or two, because it sort of reaffirms negative perceptions about folks of color. I mean, certain cats don't sell, period, suburban or, or urban, who, who sort of carry different images. Um, and you asked, I just remember you asking about blue people, we'll talk about it later. So I think it's two things. I think, it, I think it's, it's a feeding imagination. It feeds the caricatures of blackness that, that, that satisfy people's cravings for the exotic nature of what being black and urban are like. And then second of all, it, 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 it always connects to an angst. It's always connects to an angst. A love for hip hop is always an escapism or, or, or a path for something new or a way to see myself do something. Like, you know, I, and I'm not a Rick Ross fan, but when it's like midnight and the paper's due <laughs> and I throw on that, that the jump with Jay, you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, and it's like, that beat drops, like, da 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 Like, no, that's the, that's the Jeezy joint, actually. Jeezy's more crap music than anything else. But that, that hustle crap music, like, when my papers do, like, it, it, it and it, it, to me, it's a different form, right? It's, it's what it invokes, it's the emotion it invokes. The, the, the message itself is problematic. I critique it to the, to the, to the end of the world. I, I don't support that life, but it gets me through that situation of angst. And that's what hip-hop does. and the creativity of hip hop to address global problems such as climate justice, because we're now at a point in time when we need great creativity and transformation for the survival of the planet and to avert or lessen some of the worst impacts of climate change, such as superstorms, like you had in, in New York, drought and famine, flooding, um, chemical reactions that, or conditions that favor chemical reactions that erode air quality, extreme heat, etc. So thank you. Thank you. And, and Thank you for the question, and thank you for depressing me. I'm like, damn, the world is fucked up. Um, you know, I think, I, I think that, that the development of science mindedness is the key to that. It's the key to it. Um, if, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the discipline of science, we have to look at the kind of sciences that we create. So when we have school science and conventional school science, particularly in urban areas, you create a certain type of scientist. Even a kid who's successful in school science is a certain type of scientist. Y'all feel me? Okay, so listen. Let's say I'm, in a, I'm a teacher in the classroom and I'm teaching, right? And I'm teaching by giving information, giving information, and you pass that information on test. There are certain kids in that classroom who will be successful despite the awful structure of the classroom. So they will get high grades despite the fact that they don't delve deeply into the subject matter, they'll do well. That student has enough of a high, high grades to get into college. They will struggle in college a little bit. Let's say they fight through that. Let's say they, get, they end up in graduate school. Within the world of science, there are scientists, then there are innovators. There are scientists who go into the lab and can follow a scientific procedure and structure to the T. And it will always work for the guy who's getting the big grants and who's coming up with the big ideas. And so I argue that 
not even for youth of color, for all young people in this country, the nature of science instruction, because of its sort of closed way, has created a certain type of scientist who does not have the tools to come up with more innovative approaches to addressing these larger global problems. And so because of that, I argue for science mindedness because then it opens up the doors for kids who have different ways of knowing and being to be able to address these issues. It's like this project that's going on out in Cali right now about uh, the, the protein folding. You guys heard about that? So these guys were they trying to fold proteins and pretty much they sucked at it and they were scientists. And so they ended up opening this up to gamers. People who play video games. The kids who play, people who play video games have developed this sort of, this sort of spatial reasoning. By the way, spatial reasoning is one of the skills that are most lacking in mathematics education. And you find it in high amounts of people who play games often because you're sitting there all the time playing these games. So they actually opened it up to these gamers and they created a game out of it, and these gamers are folding proteins like no one's business, right? And, and simply, the, the, the basic tenet of that success, if you ask me, is that the expansion of what it means to be scientific, expansion of what it means to be science-minded, opening up folks who may not have the canonical understanding to the discipline creates opportunities for new possibilities. And, and I think science-mindedness is the root, it, it, it's, the, it's the key to developing the kind of sciences that can solve the kind of problems that you ask, that you talk about. And so I'd like to kind of turn the question on in, in the area of teaching. Um, how many folks do you feel are jumping onto the hip hop bandwagon in education? Um, teachers specifically, because I've seen it, in order to relieve their own angst in teaching and working with urban students and have you come across this, and how have you combated this? Yeah. Like, oh, this is so hot, I can, yeah. I can do this in a classroom, but then, you know, the same thing that you were just talking about before is now happening. In my head, like, I'll see folks do stuff and, and call it hip-hop pedagogy, and I'm like, you, you're just really not about that. Like, like I can just feel it, I sense it. I, I can't measure it. I, can just, I just can tell. But I can't, I can't completely dismiss it because... That's their experience with hip hop. What I can have an issue with is when it becomes a commodification, it becomes a sales tool, a sales mechanism, you try to sell all this curriculum, and I, and I still feel like that's what I critique. But if a teacher's in a classroom and it's like, oh my gosh, this hip hop stuff's hot, I'm gonna try it. I'm like, okay, yeah, try it. By the way, right, you know, my role is to say it's, it's deeper than that and to give you information. So when I encounter that with teachers, my, my, my response is never like, I'm going to battle you, son. My response is always, what can I do to help you develop this understanding in a more deep fashion? Let me push and probe. Mm -hmm. When I encounter it in a way where it's a commercial, commercialization of hip hop, and you feel it. You got, if, you, if you hip hop, you know it. There's something about hip hop. Like, Jay had this line, I put my hand on your chest, and I put my hand on my chest, it means that I feel you're real, recognized, real, and you're looking familiar. Like that line. Like, I see you, and I'm like, I can't do this. Right? And, and so you feel it. And when you feel it, you know, all you can do is just, you know, you, you provide an academic critique, and you move on. But if it's educators in classrooms, I'm just happy that they're trying something different. Particularly if it's educators with my young people, I'm like, man, it's, it, the stakes are so high. Anybody that's willing to do anything that's uh, Achievement gaps have still not changed. Do you guys realize that? Like, people turn around school, rebound schools. I, I, my, my joke was always like, race to the top, race around the corner, race around the block, like, no child left behind, all child left behind. Every single initiative, <laughs> no, it's, it's had no difference. And I, my argument is, and I'm like, I wear this with a badge of honor, and I, and I say it in any space without apology, of, and I'll say it a billion and one times, if anybody will hear me, that a culturally focused pedagogy immersed in hip hop that looks at the realities of youth experiences is the final frontier. If this shit don't work, nothing's going to work. Because everything else has been tried and retried and it hasn't, and this has never been given an opportunity to really flesh out and see what it can do. And the preliminary re research that we've done so far, it's had an impact. And I know culture's murky, and I know that it, 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 it starts bringing out race and class issues, and I know it makes people uncomfortable, but nothing else y'all came up with so far works. So, you know, what you gonna do? What do you wanna do? <laughs> Did you get any pushback from Dr. Tyson when you talked to him about the partnership? How did that go down? Um, I didn't get pushed, Dr. Tyson's just, first of all, he's the most brilliant guy, on, he's like, he knows everything about everything. Um, and so he sits there and talks, and he's just like, you know, he just writes notes. And I, he is, um, like, so I met Jizza through Professor Tyson, and he, he asked, Jizza asked to come to meet with him, and he was like, yeah. So, 
to him, he's a scientist. This is one thing you realize. They're scientists and then they're like thinking of funk scientists. Like they're scientists and then they are school scientists. Scientists are always open to innovation and creativity. It's a part of our discipline. It's the nature of science. This is why I don't know why people don't, like, why are you not scientists? Like, I'm so sorry to what your teachers did to you, but that discipline is the most beautiful discipline on the face of this planet. Because all it is is just developing your critical thinking and a search for information. The best scientists in the world know that they have no answers. So Neil deGrasse Tyson is like asking just a question, and they're talking and they're engaging because he's a scientist. If you're a scientist, you, that's what you're about. It, 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 that's what the discipline is. Some people sold you a bad version of it. It's completely different, and it's never too late. This is my science advocacy part. It's never too late to love science again. It really isn't. It's never too late. Science is a Google search away, a class away, some talks away, and then you're, and then you're a scientist again. Uh, I'm, I work in the People program here on campus, which is one of the largest, most comprehensive pre-college pipeline through college programs in the country. And I'm, I'm hearing this, I'm, I'm loving what you're, what you're saying, and I'm faced with somewhat of a conundrum because my job is to prepare the students to not only uh, be prepared uh, for admissions, but to be, have the information to be retained. So I wrote a question because I'm not the freestyle person anymore. Uh, <laughs> I guess I've been socialized to write my raps now. Uh, um, you do you think? <laughs> The man has programmed his condition. He was in condition in his condition. I'm sorry. black cross I'm sorry. Do you think the recreation of organized K through 12 instruction in this fashion would be potentially harmful for students once they have to negotiate the current traditional teaching styles of higher education? It's a brilliant question, and, and the answer the answer is no. And I'll tell you why. Um, because my goal, and, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, is to find the points of connection to how to provide entry points for kids into academia, but the entry points for me is not the final point, the final space. So once the kids are engaged and they understand they can do the work, then it's okay to do the work. So it's, for me, the, the continuum doesn't end with getting them to engage. It's, it's getting them to engage and then opening them up to the academic possibilities. And this is not a part of this talk, but it's another talk that I give. It's always on, you know, for me, the lost art of learning how to navigate uh, different social spaces, right? It, Sociologists used to call it code switching, you know, whatever you want to call it, but I think it's a, it's a necessary skill. Uh, what happens oftentimes is that people believe that they go through schooling, and then as you go through schooling, you, you learn how to appropriate, you know, how to act appropriately. That's, that's the model that we follow. And the tool that I, the model I follow is that we, we validate who you are and what you come with, and then we show you how to navigate different spaces. And even within the classroom, we actually play games with it, right? We'll say, all right, but I literally say, for the next 10 minutes, we're going to speak uh, properly. We're going to use an English accent, even, right? And we are like hyper structured. And then we go through the regular process as well. I think kids have to be able to be taught how to navigate both spaces. Because if they go through the other way, this is what happens. You go through school, and this, this happens all the time. It happens all the time right up the street in uh, a certain set of uh, charter schools. That should re remain nameless, but <laughs> unless you push me. But in those spaces, kids are taught to go into that academic space, and each year they go up, they learn, they learn to divorce themselves from who they are. The model of, of learning to be successful in, in traditional schools, they grow up so that every year, you're like, okay, don't speak that way, speak appropriately, sit well, dress like this, look like this. And th so by the time they hit the 12th grade and they're out, they are shells of their former selves. They can possibly be savvy enough to enter into an academic space, but you never fit. For, for youth of color who are immersed in hip hop, who, have, who are from meager socioeconomic backgrounds, if you learn how to appropriate the, uh, the ways of knowing and being and talk of somebody who's socioeconomically advantaged, that you're still never gonna be a part of the club because you ain't got that paper and the networks. So you have these young people of color who are trained to forget who they are, get into these institutions, they can never fit into the institution because they don't have the social networks to fit into those norms, and they can never go back to the hood because you spent 12 years of their life divorcing who they are, from, and so they end up there being drones. And there are populations of drones that exist all across this country who can't fit in any single space, and those folks, they can't fit in. They, they, they're lost. 
Then that, that's the book you have. You know, yeah, why you can't go back to the hood? Oh, no, I'm not going back there. Um, and, then, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then you ask, like, so, so what are you doing this weekend? And they're mad because they can't get into the country club. So they're lost, right? And so the work has to always be teaching youth how to navigate these different spaces, embracing who they are, and telling them to know that, and I, I wrote this piece for the captain, and I, like, I mean it with all my heart, like, different is not deficient, right? That you are different, but you're not deficient. And you are better equipped if you understand different ways of knowing and being. When I engage with the president of this college, I do not at all engage the same way I'm engaging with you, because we're just chilling and we're talking. And it's definitely not the same way I engage when I'm on my block, because I will be put out of my block. And I think <laughs> all young people have to learn how to do that. Just in terms of thinking about teacher education and thinking about how, um, as a white woman interested in, in hip hop pedagogy and reality pedagogy and, and wanting to engage in this work, but also wanting to really be aware of my positionality and my social positioning and my white privilege. Um, you know, how, how does that work? And, and you know, in terms of like teachers and identity work, I, I know I don't want you to solve this problem right now, but um, you know, just in terms of like, or like what do you say to, you know, white educators, um, or maybe you know the spaces that aren't being created in grad schools of education mm -hmm. around engaging in identity work pre-service. Yeah. I think I think the key. That's a, again, you guys like I keep saying brilliant questions because they're all really brilliant questions. I think for me the key is so simple but so complex, and is is the hip hop adage like just keep it, you know you could say keep it real, keep it a hundred, whatever you want to call it. I think it's really just upfrontness is key to anything. I think if you come to the classroom space with, with, with an awareness and a search for awareness and, a, and, a, and you know, a, not a pity mentality, but a, I have a skill set that's different than yours. I want to learn about you and you learn it. It's really that simple. It's almost like a Barney song. It's really that simple. It's really like, you know, this is who, this is who I am and I've done the unpacking of who I am. And the intellectual work of, of, of figuring out who I am is always a process. That's, that's, I think, the big piece is upfrontness and realizing that the, it's, always in, like it's always in situ. And I think you know, that's the key to it. Why I love this notion of the cipher in the, in the, in the, in the, within reality pedagogy, other than the fact that it's, it's my joint, is because when you engage in those dialogues with young people, it, it opens up the space for the educator to be upfront about their experiences. Because it's like just you and four kids. And they're saying, this is what I feel about the classroom and what I think. And you're doing the exact same thing. It's, it's, a, it's so raw, it's so pure, it's so simple. Sometimes you over, over make, make things just too complex. It's really just a frontness, clarity, and realizing that you're always a work in process, just like the students are a work in process. And I think that that's really the key to identity work. From there, we build on so much more, right? You, you get to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, your privilege is killing you and you want to choke yourself. And, like all that stuff happens. My privilege hurts me sometimes too. Like I drive around, because I have a fancy car now, and I'm like, man, like I'm, I'm so like I, I'm so down, but I'm driving this car. Like so, it takes different forms, and I think understanding where you are and how you position yourself is the key to it. But I guess with like, not even the buy-in, but just thinking about the places where this conversation isn't like, is I don't want to say this is preaching to the choir, yeah. but these are you know these are the future hip hop yeah. educators in in amazing ways, and this is how we know that this work is possible. We just push, man. We just push. This if this if this work were easy. You know, it would be easy. It's, we just push. I, I, like, I'll be completely honest. I had a conversation the other day, you know, with someone who said, you know, Chris, I really like this reality pedagogy idea. You know, somebody who I have a lot of respect for, with, you know, and said, you know, why don't you just play down the hip-hop? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I had like, I, I have those conversations. But we push because we believe it. We know it works. We know it's the last frontier. So for, the, for you guys, just push. You know, push into academic spaces. You know, push into policy spaces. Push into theorizing places, but we, I think we're at a point now where it's, a, it's enough of us where we can do something. Again, a plug, get on Hip Hop Ed, like join the movement, swing with us on Tuesday nights, you know, be a part of this army of folks, know that you're not speaking in isolation, and just push. And there's so much room for more projects. You talked about the, the project with the brain, you know, study. I think there's so much room for more projects. We haven't even tapped into that neuroscience, you know, like we need more people to do research. And that's why I started the Hip Hop Education Center at NYU, because I wanted to encourage more research. We need more of the evidence-based you know, knowledge so that we can go into these spaces and change things up. Absolutely. 
And this is the whole talk about the frontier, you know, knowing that you know, the, the traditional system has failed our youth. Um, and actually the statistic that came out with New York Public Schools that 4% of the students in the New York Public Schools are proficient in science, uh, 4%. And see, it seems like there's this kind of historical opening because it shows that the systems failed absolutely and terribly, and that you know, knowing you have you know the leadership, um, you know, at a, at a micro level, right? You know that there's this you know this just burgeoning ability because they're looking for answers, right? You know, and that there's you know, we definitely can see that with there's answers answers in this because everyone who's been doing this has seen success. So how do you think? you can massify this, right? You know, because you look at something like Teach for America, right? You know, that built on the pedagogy that is, you know, that is light, flimsy, it's not adequate to be able to prepare these students in, you know, classrooms around the country that are, you know, very diverse demographically, but the teacher core coming in there just don't have the preparation. But that's a mass, you know, that's a mass entry into the public school systems around the country um, that, you know, that really, you know, the jury's still out whether that's effective at all in terms of, you know, in terms of um, statistically changing the classroom uh, academic uh, environment. What, what do you think, you know, like 10 years from now, you know, what is going to look like, what can happen to kind of make this kind of a massive movement, you know, that there's going to be a sea change where it just, there's, you know, multiple, you know, Chris Emden's and not just, you know, these, you know, singular kind of personalities around the country and around the world. Um, because, you know, the, the, the situation is just so dire and the kids are just being, you know, they're falling apart and the system is, you know, corrupt. Um, and is it going to be, you know, Obama investing, you know, more in this kind of area of pedagogy in, in the second term because he's got kind of a, you know, this, this lame duck status? Uh, is there dialogues at that level at the, in the scientific world of, you know, taking what you're doing and kind of amplifying that? Uh, well, well, first of all, one of my answers to your question is first wave. I mean, the fact that something like first wave exists means that there's a crop of scholars who are steeped in this intellectual tradition who are going to be doing this work. Like, I know for a fact that's a crew that's going to do it, without a doubt. Then, then look at this room. I mean, you know, here's the optimism. So I'm, I'm pessimistic about the fact that oppression exists, but I'm very optimistic about the fact that there are folks who are willing to take on the challenge. Um, and I think, I think there are folks here who, who can and will do that work. As far as um, on, on a national level and more broad initiatives, I mean, this notion of science genius that, that we're working on, this new project, you know, Jizza uh, says, yo, this could be like the spelling bee. And I was like, yeah, it could be like the National Script spelling bee, spelling bee. And I mean, that's really where the vision is. The vision is that this is something that we pilot and we do well, and we take across, across the nation and if possible across the globe. Um, and I think once we're able to do that, um, people always sort of talk negatively about, about, uh, about grassroots efforts, but I think grassroots, eff grassroots efforts with cohesiveness and singular thought become mainstream efforts. And I, I think it's a matter of taking these small things that occur in these spaces and implanting those models in different spaces. Like, I'd love for your first wave scholars to be like, you know what, when I leave this place, I'm going to do some science genius battles in my institution, right? So I, I think the possibilities are there. Um, in regards to the, to the president and his decision making, um, I have a very interesting take on, on, on the politics of education. I, I don't think it's the president per se. I think the, pre I think the president is informed by misinformed people. I, I, I really believe that. I think, and I think that one of the most painful things in any arena, education, life, whatever, is misinformation and good intentions. Like when those two things come together, it's a recipe for disaster. So I think a lot of those folks actually think that they have, they're like, no child will be ever left behind. You know? Like, they, they really have good intentions. And when you have good intentions with misinformation, it's very tough for you to open up the possibilities to look at the fact that something else may exist. And so what we have to be able to do is a lot to be really more vocal. I always tell folks, I never wrote to a speech solo. Like, my crew is always with me. Like, you guys out there are always rocking with me. And the folks here are. And if we have a critical mass of folks who believe in this work and keep pushing, we, we, we will change the game. It's inevitable. It's definitely happening. I Thank mean, you, bro. I mean, right now, we have over 300 scholars and practitioners in the United States alone that we know are doing the work in academia and in high schools. We have an entire high school, Hip Hop High, right? This high school for recording arts in Minnesota. So we're getting there, but the evidence I cannot stress that enough. We need evidence. We need 
you know, to create a process, a template, and you, you're doing it, and so many other people are doing it. A lot, a lot of, um, I guess, the work around critical pedagogy and cultural relevant pedagogy um, is based on, you know, urban students, students of color in urban areas, and, um, you know, I teach hip hop in the suburbs. And I actually tried searching last weekend for um, critical pedagogy in the suburbs, and all I found was one article on Australia. Um, oh, critical pedagogy and cultural relevant pedagogy and hip hop pedagogy in the suburbs is the topic here. And I'm wondering, is that because there isn't a need for that? Because I would argue that there are working class students and students of color in the suburbs. They exist, and I feel like they need us too, and they need this work too. And I'm wondering, like, are they being ignored? Am I just not tapping into wherever those resources are? Um, and if that work does need to be done in non quote unquote urban areas, what does that look like and how is it different? Because it is different, right? And a lot of things that you, know, you mentioned with what our students already come in with, and a lot of my students can't just come in freestyle, and those who think they can, can't. Um, we're trying really hard, but they don't, you know, they're not, like you said, they're not about that life. And so I wonder, like, what, how is that different and should that just be ignored because it changes the game a little bit? Or like, what's that? Of course it should be ignored. Like, you know, I think my, my work is on, on, on justice and equity for all students. And um, I think the reason why it doesn't exist is because people focus on where it's out, right in your face. That, that's just, it's, it's, it's human nature. It's like, oh my gosh, it's so bad here. Let's focus here. But I think the different forms of oppression in different spaces. And that's why scholars like you exist. And just the conversation we had about expanding the nature of the work. The fact that no one's doing that work means, you know, get going, Lauren. You know, that, that's what it means. And I, so I think you can, you can definitely do that work. And I think what it looks like, of course, will always vary. And that's the beauty of it. And again, this is why I advocate for reality pedagogy. Because a reality pedagogy will allow you to, I actually did some comparative work recently with some, my kids in the Bronx and some kids in Dresden, Germany, using reality pedagogy as a framework. And we found a lot of similar themes. Um, but there were also different iterations of their experiences. But that reality pedagogy became a tool. Co-gens, co-teaching, cosmopolitanism, making the kids feel responsible for what's going on in the classroom, a hyper-focus on using their context to unpack their teaching, and then having the teacher understand their content expertise. And that tool, implantable anywhere, and then what comes out of the research will vary. So when, so I, 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 I do it in, in uh, New York City, I get different ideas about these realities and make that transform the teaching in that space. I do it in suburbia, same tool, different things bubble up, or the same things bubble up. So I think it's a, it's a nice enough template that allow you to understand the different unique experiences of the young people.